Hey there, and welcome to Cyberpunk Librarian. I'm Daniel Messer. There are a lot of programs and software that come about simply because the programmer had an itch to scratch. In other words, the person writing the code was trying to solve a problem that they themselves were having, and then maybe they decided to share their work with others. In my perfect world, this happens through the process of open source. But the world isn't perfect, and sometimes people keep all of that code to themselves and sell the binaries as proprietary software. As Vonnegut once said, so it goes. And really, I don't have a problem with proprietary software. Hell, I'm writing the notes and drafts of this show on an iPad Pro in an app called IA Writer. Neither of those speak to my love of open source, but rather they cater to my love of good hardware design and markdown. I'm an occasional coder myself, and like those before me, I write code to solve problems, to automate a process to make a thing work better, or streamline it so it works more easily. Since I've worked in libraries for over 20 years now, closing in on 25 as of this recording, I tend to write a lot of code aimed at fixing library-related problems. I've written programs that make web slides, automate tasks on the integrated library system. I make programs check on processes and alert me when something goes sideways. Some of these things handle logistical issues, and some of these things just do other things that I need doing. And it dawned on me. Surely I'm not the only one with these particular itches, with these particular problems. And while my problems may be library-related, there are plenty of libraries out there that face similar issues because, goodness knows, I am not unique in the problems I face. Well, at least not at work. So... Why not share this stuff? Granted, I've got a couple things on GitHub, and I've sent zip code to other libraries who knew I did a thing, and they wanted to do that thing too. But why not create a more focused, if not formal, collection of software and offer it to other libraries and librarians for the low, low price of free and open source? So, I've been working on that. Getting things together and making them ready to share. If you're wondering where I've been the last couple months and what I've been working on, well, you're about to find out. Now, let me tell you about the fossil projects. This is Cyberpunk Librarian, episode 56, The Fossil Projects. My name is Daniel Messer, your friendly neighborhood cyberpunk librarian, welcoming you to the show that explores the intersections of libraries and technology and is all about living that high-tech, low-budget lifestyle. Hello out there, ladies and gentlemen, and genders outside and in between. Cyberpunk Librarian is back after a long hiatus, and I tell you, it feels so good to get back in front of the microphone and press that shiny red button again. I recently spent a bit of time in the forests and deserts of California, doing some hiking and clearing my head, and, you know, too many things running around my brain. And let me tell you, if if ever I start a second career, it'll likely be something to do with forests or deserts. I absolutely loved it out there. But I'm back here in the deserts of Arizona, And we have one hell of a show for you this time, dear listener, or at least I hope so, because I'm sharing something with y'all that I've been working on for the past several months, really, and that is something I call The Fossil Projects. This is a name that makes me happy in a couple of nerdy ways, because as you'll soon see, it's a pretty decent acronym, and it harkens back to the days of BBS door programs and the need for fossil drivers and stuff like that. Granted, that last part may be oddly specific to me. I'm still working on my BBS, by the way. I've just stalled on it a bit while I worked on this project. It kind of took over everything and sort of became the number one thing that I've been doing recently, which also explains what happened to this show. But, okay, 
enough of that. I wanted to thank you for tuning in, and now we can dive into the depths of whatever it is I plan to talk about and bring you up to speed with something that I've been hammering on for weeks now. It's a collection of software for libraries, and it's all free. It's all open source, and much of it is still under somewhat active development. At least it is when I'm not trying to put a website together about it and write a show about it. So you'll notice that you know, somewhat active development is a good description. And indeed, some of this stuff isn't even done yet. We'll talk about that, and we'll touch on some individual programs, what they do, and how you can get a hold of them. Okay, my lovelies, right on. So... Let's get started. Hi, my name is Dan, and I write code. More specifically, I write PHP targeting Linux servers with a MariaDB database. Most of my software is browser-based, but I also have a few command-line things written in Python. Indeed, I regularly call Python from PHP because each language has its strengths and weaknesses. I also write scripts in a Windows-based language called AutoHotKey, and that's something I've used to automate Windows and integrated library systems like the Polaris ILS. I will rarely refer to myself as a software developer, and only under certain circumstances. Those circumstances being that it's the end of the night and I've had a little too much to drink, or that I'm being flippant and quite possibly both. I call myself a coder because I'm not a professional developer, nor am I good enough at any of it to consider myself even an amateur developer. I think I wind up looking at Stack Overflow responses far too often to believe that I inhabit the lofty rank of, well, rank amateur. But when I do write code, it's because I'm solving problems, whether they be my own or something I'm facing at work. I'm scratching that itch. Because I'm merely a coder and not a developer, I typically turn the sky blue over my desk with the language that I use. I don't want to put an explicit tag on this episode, but the best part of learning different languages is the profanity. That's, that is the most useful thing, because I can swear in German, Japanese, Gaelic, and a little bit of Scots. No one within earshot of my desk speaks any of those, so yeah. That's another indication that I'm not a developer. I don't believe professional developers swear that much. I mean, I can't picture Marco Arment, Casey Liss, or John Syracuse sitting at their desks and referring to their computers as, well, things, only to discover that the problem they were having arises from the lack of a semicolon at the end of line 263. True story. PHP uh, ends most of its lines in semicolons, and if you forget one, it doesn't, doesn't work. Yeah, just doesn't, doesn't work. So, yeah, I wanted to get it firmly set in your mind that I'm able to write functioning code. My code isn't pretty, and I, it sure isn't elegant. Uh, I mean, it's, it's as elegant as using a hammer to slice cheese. And, you know, really, that's not the point. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just not interested in so-called beautiful code or the WordPress ideal that code is poetry. If code is poetry, then the stuff that I write is a filthy limerick about a depraved man from Nantucket. So, if you know what you're doing, and you are a developer, and you take a look at my code and then recoil in horror, well, damn it, I warned you. Okay, that out of the way, let's talk fossil, and not the paleontological kind. FOSSIL is an acronym for Free Open Source Solutions in Libraries, and that's what this is all about. Programs, software, and ideas that any library anywhere can use. Hopefully, it makes their work easier, and that means better service for library patrons and library staff. Whenever I look into some company that specializes in selling things to libraries, be it equipment or conferences or tech or anything like that, I'm usually blown away by how much money they want for things. 
So many of these library organizations and library-focused companies seem to have lost touch with the fact that libraries don't exactly have massive budgets. Yes, sure, they're a government entity. That doesn't mean they come with a big government budget. They're libraries. They're not building aircraft. One of the reasons the fossil projects exist is because I needed to do something, and there was no way I was going to be able to buy a thing to do it with, so... I may as well make that something on my own. Everything on the Fossil Projects website is free and open source. Even the website itself runs on free and open source software. The software is hosted on GitLab, which is also free and open source. Preliminary work on the software repositories are handled on my own virtual Linux server at home through a Git management system called GOGS. In other words, from back to front, from start to finish, Everything about the Fossil Projects is free and open source. That means you don't need to purchase special software to run any of this stuff. You need a Linux box for most of it, yes. But now notice I didn't say Linux server there. You can host and run the software on a virtual Linux server like I do. Or you can use an older computer running Linux. Many of the projects that I've done would probably be totally fine running on a Raspberry Pi or an old netbook. Heck, one or two of the projects actually targets a Raspberry Pi. So, with free software and existing or inexpensive hardware, you can be up and running for almost nothing. Look, I've been using the catchphrase high-tech and low-budget ever since I started doing this show. This is a chance to prove that I really mean it. So, okay, loves, let's talk about some of my favorite fossil projects and how they might help you and your library. Some of these projects might actually get their own show in the future, but for now, let's take a look at what I've got online currently. The thing is, these little projects are exactly that, what's online right now. I've got more, but I'm working on preparing them to go up where people can get them. And speaking of which, you might be wondering where you can find this stuff. Well, there are a couple of places, actually. Of course, you can find the links in the show notes, but real quickly... The first is the Fossil Projects website, available at cyberpunklibrarian.com slash fossil. And that's F-O-S-S-I-L. I I didn't do any of that Web 2.0, 3.0 nonsense of eliminating a vowel for no particular reason. Flickr may have lost its E, but I know exactly where the O and I are in Fossil. The website provides an index, an overview, and just general information about given projects. What I'm working on updates, stuff like that. The second place is GitLab. Now, even if you don't know what GitLab is, you may have heard of GitHub. GitHub is a place where tons of developers upload and share their code and projects where other people can get to it. Using a system called Git, which is spelled G-I-T as in stupid Git, GitHub is a massive online repository of open source code and more. It's also running on a lot of proprietary software, and it was recently purchased by Microsoft. So, hmm. I pieced out of GitHub, and then I set up on GitLab, which I think is superior for several reasons. GitLab is fully open source. You can even download it and run it on your own server. I also think the interface is better, and it provides more information. And while I'm not one of those people who did have a panic attack when Microsoft bought GitHub because lots of people saw that coming, it still didn't sit very well with me. Since I was starting this new project, there really wasn't any migration or anything like that to deal with, so all I did was choose a different space that wasn't GitHub. Anyway, you'll find the growing collection of fossil projects at gitlab.com slash fossil projects. That's all one word. And, of course, you'll find information and linkage about all of this stuff in the show notes at cyberpunklibrarian.com slash podcast. 
Great. Now let's take a look at what's currently available. Cargo Cult. Let's start with something simple. This project came about when I needed to work with the library's courier system on a regular basis. To bring non-library listeners up to speed, many large libraries have a courier service that transports items and materials between branches. The library I work for has branches scattered all over a county that's bigger than some East Coast states. I work in the administrative offices, and we ship to each branch from there, along with sending items to other community libraries that aren't exactly affiliated with us, but they're located nearby. We ship items in totes, or what most people would probably call bins. They're plastic boxes that can hold stuff, and there are holes on the sides of hinged lids that we secure with cable ties. That's not a security feature or anything, it's just something that keeps the lid closed should the tote fall over, you know, in the truck or something like that. Each tote has a place on the side where we can slide a slip of paper into it that indicates where the tote needs to go. This small slip of paper basically has a branch or library abbreviation on it, and that's the thing that lies at the heart of the problem. See, there are a couple of ways you can get this slip. You can make one yourself, using scratch paper or post-it, or you can dig around into a drawer until you find a pre-made slip that has the branch that you need on it. Another one of these is a really great solution when you're shipping 20 to 40 totes per day, and all of them need a label of some kind. Wouldn't it be better to just generate the slip on demand? So... After speaking to my boss and to the folks in IT, I had them put a computer in the shipping room. Alongside that computer sits an attached thermal receipt printer. And then I sat down with my virtual Linux server on my MacBook Pro and started making a database and writing some code. And that's where Cargo Cult came from. Cargo Cult is written in PHP and it's a browser-based, easy-to-use system that generates these bin labels on demand. It's optimized for a touch interface, so it'll work well on touch screens and tablets. And once you set up your database, Cargo Cult just pulls the information into its user interface, which is literally nothing but buttons. To make things even easier, I set up a special shortcut for Chrome to open in kiosk mode with kiosk printing. And what that means is that Cargo Cult is displayed full screen, and when you tap or click a button, it doesn't ask for confirmation to print. It just prints the tag to the receipt printer. This cut my time in the shipping room significantly. No more searching for post-its in a Sharpie. No more scratching things on the post-its with the Sharpie. No more digging around in really kind of what amounts to a junk drawer. Click a button. Get a tote tag. That's it. It's pretty simple. As a side feature, I also added the ability to generate shipping slips, which we use when sending items from one library system to another. It happens all the time around here that a patron will accidentally return an item from one library to another different library system. We just ship these things back with a slip that says where it goes and where it's coming from. You'll find pictures of the tags in the show notes, along with a link to a demo of Cargo Cult if you want to try it out. You don't really need a receipt printer, and you don't even have to print anything if you don't want to, because unless you're using a kiosk mode browser, it'll ask for confirmation. You'll find these in the show notes, of course, at cyberpunklibrarian.com slash podcast. Slide off hand. This next project is one I don't use that much anymore, but it's something I could see being useful for people out there who need to make event slides for their websites and library catalogs. When I was working in web content, one of my jobs was to make images for the library's website, and these images were to call attention to various events at various branches. They rotate through a large image carousel on our front page, kind of like digital signage. It wasn't unusual to make over 100 of these things per month, and during the busy summer months, because for a librarian, summer is like Christmas in retail, well, I could make around 300 of them easily in a month. At every step along the way, 
I tried something, anything that I could do to streamline the process. Since I started out using Photoshop, I created a template. That way, all the event slides would have a uniform look, but I'd also be able to just plug in information as needed, export the slide, reload the template, and move on. I had little scripts to help things along, but one day I finally reached a point where I realized that I was spending more time making these slides than doing almost anything else. Since making event slides wasn't the only thing I was supposed to be doing, I needed to try something different. And then I realized, once I have the image for the slide, everything else is mostly the same. All of the event metadata, that, that never changes. There's always an event title. There is always an event location. There's always an event day and time, and they always go in the same locations. Getting the image for the slide was usually pretty easy, and indeed, I usually kept my own cache of images that I'd draw on from the regulars. So, you know, why, why keep going back to a website looking for the same image over and over again? Just save it and, you know, give it some kind of name that makes it easier to find. But in the end, why not take Photoshop out of this equation completely and just write a program that will do most of the heavy work for me? These days, I call that program Slide Off Hand. It takes the work of making slides off your hands and gives the work to the software, hence the name. See, all I was doing in Photoshop was cropping and resizing the image for the slide. Everything else was either typed or scripted. By getting away from the resizing bit, well, I could do most of the work by typing, which is something that I do pretty well and fairly quickly. Slide of Hand is a PHP web app that utilizes image magic on the back end. If you're not familiar with image magic, it's a free and open source program that lets you make and manipulate images from the command line, which it's super nerdy, but kind of once you get the feel for it and what it might be able to do for you, oh, it can be super useful too. It's also got plenty of hooks for other languages, and PHP is one of those. Using both, I can take input from PHP and send it over to Image Magic and have it create a slide based on that input, and then display that slide in my browser where I can quickly and easily save it. So here's a quick overview of the workflow. The first thing you'll do with Slide of Hand is upload an image. I recommend using an image that's 1920 by 1024, just somewhere in that range. It just seems to work best for these slides. After processing the image, Slide of Hand displays the image with a pre-sized cropping box. In this case, it's the exact size that you would need for the slide that I was making at the time. Obviously, this stuff is open source software. If you're interested in this and need to make changes to the size of the slide or the box, well, it's there, and I can help you do that if need be. But you can move this box around the image to get the part of the picture that you want to use on the slide. Make that selection and then move on. You'll be asked for an event title, the time, and the date of the event, and then you select the branch from a drop-down list, and that way you'll never misspell the name of the branch. You're also asked for a color for the info bar. There are four choices, blue, gray, red, and purple. You can add more, that's just what I went to keep with, uh, to keep things simple. Click the Generate button, and Slide of Hand creates a slide. That slide has a unique name and includes the branch, so you can easily reference, you know, which slide, which image, which JPEG is for what thing. So you'll never have to worry about multiple files for the same branch with the same name. Indeed, some branches may repeat the same program several times. Like a regular story time, for instance. You can quickly and easily generate the entire run of slides for this because... On the final screen, where you've generated the slide, your data stays on the screen. If you're making slides for an entire run of, say, a teddy bear story time, a program that might last two months and runs every week, you can reuse the same image and just change the dates and perhaps the info bar color to just give it some variation. Make the changes, hit generate, get a new slide. Make the changes, hit generate, get a new slide. And you can save that slide knowing it won't collide with the one you just made for the same event at the same branch.
Sign Brewery. Sign Brewery is a work in progress that's about halfway done. This is a project born out of an idea by some colleagues and friends where they wanted something that was part digital signage system and part content distribution system. The idea was to have something you could easily set up at a library or in an event or in an off-site location or wherever, and that thing would display images about events, about the library, about things going on, anything, but it also offered a curated digital download system. Say the library was attending a community event, maybe a school carnival or something. They've got a table or a booth, and they could set up a monitor hooked to the Wi-Fi or just simply to a Raspberry Pi, and the display on that, that system would roll through signs about the library, about resources, about events, and so on. And one slide could also let people know that they could download an ebook or music or video or, well, anything really, and they could do it right now on their phone or tablet and no library card needed. The content can be lots of things, but the idea was to work with local authors, musicians, and creators to get things that people might like. There could be public domain books with custom covers that promote the library. You know, things like that. You, could, you can go lots of directions with this idea. Additionally, statistics would be tracked, but anonymized. So you could see what was downloaded, but not by whom. None of that information would be retained or even asked for. It's kind of like the marriage of a library box and a digital signage system. Signberry is about halfway done as of this recording, and I actually can't wait to get this episode out because I'm going to go back to work on it after I do. The digital signage component is in place, and it works pretty well. It's designed for use on a Raspberry Pi, but it could be put on a web server and accessed through Wi-Fi or cables. I've done that before myself. I need to write up some better documentation, but if you're in the mood to try it as a digital signage solution, well, let me know, and I'd be happy to help you set it up. It's database-driven and offers the ability to upload your slides based on calendar dates and times. That way you can schedule slides to go up and come down as needed. It currently supports JPEG, PNG, PNG, and GIF images as well as MP4 video. WebM support is coming along just as soon as I make a few tweaks, and of course the addition of the content distribution piece is a work in progress. Things are finally settling down for the summer, and after I get this episode out, like I said, I hope to be getting back on that within the next few days and getting things closer to a more finished product. Manifestopheles This project takes us back to shipping and receiving and is something I'm still actively working on. It's going to take a little bit of explanation, so bear with me for just a moment, please. When you're shipping stuff in totes, you normally have lots of stuff in those totes. The ones we use at work can hold an average of about 32 items, and that's mixed material types. So we're talking about books, DVDs, Blu-rays, CDs, and so on, all just thrown in a bin. Well, they're neatly stacked, but still. These items are both en route to their branches because they were returned at a different branch, or they're going to a different branch because someone requested the item. We call these en routes and hold routes, respectively. A busy branch can ship out and receive 30 to 40 bins per day, but some of the busiest will do upwards of 50 per day, and sometimes more, depending on the time of year. And each item in that bin needs to be checked in upon arrival. That marks it as arrived and will then tell the staff what to do with it. Needless to say, checking in 960 to over 1,000 items, well, that takes a lot of time. It would be far better and far faster if we could check in the entire bin all at once. Turns out there's a way to do just that. In the shipping and distribution world, and within large library systems, they use a system called tote manifesting. The overall process is wonderfully simple. If you know what's in a bin, you can act upon those things in total, rather than individually. So if you keep a list of items that you're throwing in the bin, and you can pull up that list later, then you can do all kinds of things. 
When you remember that these bins are properly called totes, and that this list is called a manifest, well, now you know where the term tote manifesting comes from. You're simply making a list of all of the things in the tote. You can know where that item was last seen, for instance, and when it was shipped, and which bin it was in. You can know where that item was going. You can know what else was in that bin along with that item. Tracking things becomes easier, and in some cases it becomes possible at all, because with most ILS solutions, you'll know that, you know, an item was checked in and it was marked for transit. And really, that's the last the ILS knows about it until it shows up again. Oh, and you can feed that list to your ILS and check in the entire bin at the same time. In my tests, I found that processing the average tote of 32 items or so takes about a minute and a half. And when you're done with that bin, well, you're done with those items. They can be either put away or sent to the whole pickup shelf so people can get their requests. Because I like giving my project silly names, in case you haven't noticed that by now, I came up with a doozy for this one. Because tote manifesting is a hell of a problem and the devil is in the details. And thus, Manifestopheles was born. None of this, none of this is groundbreaking. FedEx, UPS, Amazon, they all do something like this. Big libraries use something like this, but there's one big difference. Those systems cost quite a bit of money to buy, install, run, and maintain. Manifestopheles is free. It's a database-driven PHP and Python web app that's, it's streamlined for speed. You can run the server-side stuff on an older computer, and it'll work fine. I've run the server-side pieces on virtual machines, an old netbook, an older desktop running Linux, and an 8-year-old Linux server. I've run the system on as little as 2 gigs of RAM and a Zubuntu virtual machine. The staff-side work is browser-based, and, well, any web browser will do. I've run it on iPads, Chromebooks, Windows PCs, Raspberry Pis, and Macs. When you activate its check-in subroutine, it'll talk to the ILS SIP server using a Python script. That's the beauty of Manifestopheles. It uses SIP2, which is a standard for lots of ILS solutions. While I've geared Manifestopheles to work with the Polaris ILS, there's really no reason it couldn't work with Koha, Evergreen, Sierra, or any other ILS that offers SIP2 communications, which is most of them. You might need to make some changes to get that to work, because while SIP2 is a well-established protocol for software talking to ILS programs, eh, every one of every ILS solution seems to use it a little bit differently. Yeah, that's fine. But that's what open source is for, and once again, I'm here to help as best I can. Manifestopheles does require a little bit of work to set up, but I've sent over 4,000 items through my testing server and I haven't seen a hiccup yet. I say yet because no code is ever bug-free. If you're interested, contact me. I'll answer questions. I'll help with setup. I'll see what I can do to help you get set up and running, even if it's just on a testing basis. Now, finally, keep in mind that these projects are just the start. I've got several more that I'm updating, retesting, just to kind of make sure they still work and making sure that they're, you know, doing well before I put them online. As I get those done, I'll get them up on GitLab and on the Fossil Projects website. Maybe you don't need any of this stuff, or maybe you'll only find one to be useful. Either way, if one of these little projects makes your library life easier, well, everything is free to try, and then it's equally free to keep it. All I ask is, hey... Let me know if you're using something of mine, because that kind of thing makes me feel real good. And that wraps up another episode of Cyberpunk Librarian. I thank you for tuning in and for listening to the show and, of course, for sticking with the show. I know I've been updating really infrequently here and there just because, well, now you know. I mean, I've been working on this Fossil Projects thing, and it is a bit of a time sink. But I think all the front loading's done. I think the uh, I think the big hurdle has been overcome, and now I can just sort of 
get things in there and work on things and all of that. What's even stranger still, folks, is that I've got another episode of this show ready to go. I just need to basically press that shiny red button one more time. The tune you're currently digging on is Catching Rays by Psychedelic Pedestrian. Earlier in the show, you heard Fluid Dreams by Daniel Birch and Overcast by Fascinating Earthbound Objects. As always, the opening track is Belly Dance at Abisu by Ryo Miyashita, and you can find links to all of these songs in the show notes at cyberpunklibrarian.com slash podcast. You'll also find a link to, well, an index of pretty much everything that I've ever put into the uh, into the episodes of the show. So if you like this music, well, I have provided an index that will link you to music very similar to it and in some ways very different to what you're hearing now. So check that out in the show notes at cyberpunklibrarian.com slash podcast. If you'd like to get a hold of me online, well, I heartily suggest you do so. You can reach out to me on Twitter, where I am Bibrarian. That's at B-I-B-R-A-R-I-A-N. It's like librarian, but it starts with a B. I'm also trying out that nifty new Mastodon service thing, and there is a really cool Mastodon instance that's set up for uh, galleries, librarians, and archivists, and museum workers, and all of that. The Glam the glam folks, as they are sometimes called, and that you can uh, reach out to me there. I am at cyberpunk librarian at glamour.us, and that's G-L-A-M-M-R dot U-S. So it's cyberpunk librarian at glamorous, and that's pretty freaking cool if you ask me. And finally, you can always hit me up via the old school SMTP and IMAP protocols through cyberpunk librarian at protonmail.com. So I'm about to get out of here. I thank you so much for listening. I will be back very soon with a show that I swear to God I've already written, and you will be hearing from me very soon. Now that I've got a couple shows in the can, I hope to actually be updating this show on a far more regular basis. So thank you for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed, and I will see you next time. But remember, you don't have to be high tech to be low budget. It just certainly helps if you're a cyberpunk. Take care out there. Bye now. 